Let's open in prayer. Father God in heaven, we come before you uh, once again here this afternoon. We thank you for our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for ever saving us. And we pray now for the young kids that have just heard the gospel, that they would simply lean to, towards your word and just believe that Jesus died for them. Father, we ask you for help in bringing forth a message here that we would have the ability to bring honor and glory to God and to your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, Father. And what we say, and, and uh, hopefully those in the audience here today will glean a little bit from it. So, Father, with that, we would ask you to bless us in the Lord's precious and wonderful name. Amen. Well, it's time for the afternoon ministry meeting. I've been sitting out there, and I've stood up here. I know it's a time when everybody's eyelids get very heavy. They start to weigh down, and I often stand up here and just watch people and see their eyes fluttering a little bit, or you get the big eyeballs, you know, they're just doing whatever they can to keep their eyes open. And so I'm going to try to keep it short and very simple. There is not going to be a huge theological lesson here. I purposely try to just take little events out of my life and bring them into yours. And um, they always seem so simple when I first start out. And then halfway through the message, when I'm working on it, I said, man, I don't, I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to present this thing here. But uh, anyway, I'm going to let God present it. So... Uh, there was a couple of verses that I read when I was opening in Wednesday night meeting. Mark chapter 1. So I'm reading it Wednesday night, first night I'm reading it. And uh, as I'm reading it, uh, something struck me while I was reading it. Just a little twist to it that I never had before. And so it spoke to me. And uh, I'm going to attempt to try and outline some of the thoughts that I was having about it. Uh, Mark chapter 1 and verse 21, and, there, and it's talking about the Lord and some of his disciples coming in. And it says, And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were amazed at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was there in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, come out of him. And they were amazed, uh, decided to come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. And they were amazed so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding regions of Galilee. So that Wednesday night when I was reading this, um, what struck me? The miracles? Boy, they always touch our hearts, don't they? Anytime you see the Lord Jesus Christ operating and you see a situation and all of a sudden he turns it all around. And so, yeah, the miracles and the teachings um, he spoke with authority. They weren't used to that. Uh, and those things always come out at us and talk to us. But for whatever reason, what really jumped off the page at me was twice I read that they were amazed. That they were amazed. 
at what they saw with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you've got to understand and just try to imagine the people that we're dealing with here. And so, so they're sitting in a synagogue, and the Lord Jesus Christ, the words that he said, the actions that he took in front of them, it changed their minds. It changed their thoughts. It changed their hearts. They were awestruck and astonished. Can you just imagine the look on their faces? All these Jewish people that come week after week and they come into the synagogue and they're all waiting to go through their, their weekly ritual, their ceremony. And in comes a man. A common looking man. Not educated. A carpenter from Nazareth. And he comes in and he starts to teach them. Then this spirit, this guy comes up to him, is possessed, and he takes care of it. The people, for the first time in their lives, were in the presence of God. They had gone through this every week, trying to reach God, but today, they're in the presence of the Son of God, the King. And they were amazed. They were absolutely amazed by it. And in John chapter 7, uh, the officers come back to the Pharisees and they were supposed to get the Lord Jesus Christ and they didn't have Him. And they came back and said, never a man spoke like this man. You don't understand. The man you sent us after is different than any other man we have ever saw. And they said, do you believe in him now too? What's going on here? Yeah. They knew that they weren't dealing with the normal man. And I was taken up by the fact that they said never. You know, when we went to school, I always felt the only chance I had in school was a true and false test. If I had to come up with an answer... Or guess one out of four, probably not going to do very well. But there was a rule. If anybody says never or always, false. There's almost, there's nothing that is never or always. These people said never. And they were right. There was never a man spoke like this man. He even sent the demons away. People... They didn't just say, hey, that's amazing. We say it all the time, right? Wow, that's amazing. They didn't use a descriptive term to try and tell everybody what had happened. They were amazed. They were in a state of amazement. And when I read through uh, Mark. I, my opening comments that day were reading the first chapter of Mark. It's a very uh, straightforward description, a common outline of the life of Christ. Very straightforward, common outline. On the way home, I thought, what are you talking about? There is nothing common about the life of Christ. You read about people who were shocked, who were in awe, who were awestruck by the presence of the Lord. There's nothing common there. And then I thought to myself, and I'd like to ask you the same question. Does our Lord and Savior, does Jesus Christ, still amaze me? How many times this past week were you stopped in your tracks? Were you set back on your heels and you thought to yourself, man, Jesus amazes me. It's a good thing. It's a very good thing. 
Because when the Lord Jesus Christ does amaze us, it changes us. It has a real change in us. It influences the way we think. It changes our heart. It changes our motives in life. It changes everything about us. And I guess after reading this and thinking about it, I want to be touched. I want to be amazed by Christ every day of my life. It's vitally important. And you know, we're blessed to see over and over again examples of how the Lord Jesus Christ amazed people when He was on the earth, right? If I came up to you and asked you, how has the Lord amazed people when He was on the earth? You could come up with 50 different ways, right? The disciples in a boat. They had seen miracles by the Lord. They knew who He was, but they were in the boat and they are getting trashed all over the place. All over the place. And they go get the Lord. He's sleeping. And he comes up to the top of the boat. And, you know, he didn't do anything dramatic. He didn't lift his arms like we picture Moses doing. He said, be still. Be still. And it turned from tormentous waves into like glass. Do you think they were amazed? Who is this man? He even controls the environment. Yeah, we saw him do miracles. But man, we're amazed. How about when they took off with Adam and they saw a shadow out there and he comes walking up to them? <laughs> what? What is that? Amazed? How about when there's thousands of people there and the disciples are saying, it is getting late. We have nothing to feed these people. Let's get them out of here. Send them home. Lord, we got to send them home. Did they forget that he calmed the water? Did they forget that he walked on the water? The Lord said, give me those two little loaves and a fish. He started blessing them and breaking them. You think they were amazed when they picked up 12 baskets of fragments? Wow, would that have amazed them? The Mount of Transfiguration. How about when they saw him up there and they wanted to build, you know, memorials and everything else up there? Or when Martha and Mary had lost their brother Lazarus? And the Lord deliberately waited and he came in after he was dead. Martha's telling him, please, do not open the tomb. My brother, he already stinks. He's been in there. Lord, open the tomb. And Lazarus comes out. He amazed everybody that day. He gave life to where there was no life. And you say, you know what? I, too, love to read about those things, and they are encouraging to know the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, but those are kind of biblical. Um, we're living in 2017, don't know about a lot of that type of stuff happening today. Well, if you ever get a chance, go have a talk with my mom. My mom has hit encounters with the Lord Jesus Christ that will make the hair stand up on the back of your neck. They are amazing. But we have them too. We have the same things going for us. And we have to search them out and look for them. I can tell you right now, we moved Eric so many times that I can't even stand... I actually get an anxiety attack. I'm serious. When I see a U-Haul truck pass me, I get sick to my stomach because we've moved that kid so many times. And the last time me and Madeline went down there, we walk into his apartment, and I can tell you, I don't know about you, 
But I was a defeated man. As soon as I walked into that apartment and I saw hordes of things in there, I said, we're dead. We are dead. We don't have any help. We don't have Matthew or Matthew with us. They both helped us one time. We didn't have all these things. I said, we're done. And every obstacle that came before us was resolved. Every obstacle. We got him moved out into the truck. I was dead. I thought I made 40 some moves up and down three flights of stairs. I said, I can't do anymore. Guess what? Nathan Kluter showed up. Unloaded the whole truck and took it in the house with Eric and his two buddies. You know what I did? Sat out in the porch. Sat out in the porch. I had a hillbilly porch set set up. I had, Eric had two chairs and I put a garbage can upside down, put a can of iced tea on there. I sat out in the porch. I was amazed that we got that kid moved in so easily. Amazed. And I know that we didn't do it. So why were these people so amazed? Why were they so awestruck? Because they were sitting in a synagogue that they had gone to every week. And so I just looked up what they did in there. And you talk about tradition, ceremony, all this kind of stuff. You read through what they did every day in the synagogue, every Sunday or Sabbath? Sabbath? I'm correcting on that. Service began with several blessing, blessing offers to God. The congregation then recited the Shema. They recited the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. And then the Torah scrolls were brought out by a Hazen, who was a person who brought these scrolls out, and they read several portions, up to seven, no more than seven. And I imagine that's something to do with perfection. But anyway, different people were scheduled to read the portion. They had to read what was scheduled. No impromptu, there was no spiritual leading. This was what you're going to read. You're going to read it. Following the Torah, the section from the prophets was read. It had its own name. Uh, would be read by a reader after the reading. A short sermon was offered, something to try to describe what they were reading. Uh, an, ad, an adult member of the community could do it, whoever. And then a benediction was given and found in the Torah. It was a specific thing. A, pr a priest presented it. And on top of all of that, they had all these high-level religious people who sat in the nice places and all the common people were there listening to it. And they had rules and regulations and the Pharisees and the scribes and all the tradition. As I read through this, you know what I said? There's nothing amazing about this. There's no life here. There's no relationship with God. And even the Lord Jesus Christ says in Matthew chapter 23, as he's trying to describe these scribes and Pharisees and the people who put this whole thing together, they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on the shoulders of men. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. In Matthew 23 and 27, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but on the inside are filled of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. It was all for show. There was nothing there. There was no life. So when the Lord Jesus Christ came in, what did he tell them? They're sitting there waiting for that to come in again. And all of a sudden, he shows up. And I like reading in Luke chapter 4, in verse 18, is the Lord quotes Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. He comes in and he tells them in a synagogue, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He speaks with authority. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor and has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and opening the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He reads in that scripture. Totally different than what they're expecting to experience that day. Liberty. Release from captivity. Release from bounds and chains. 
And then there, he, then he followed it up and he said, today these scriptures are fulfilled in the here. I am it. I am here to do all of these things for you. And he preached and marked that the fulfillment uh, of the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. I am the Messiah. I am the Messiah. Believe in me. He gave them hope. He gave them a promise. He took away all the tradition and the ceremony and He gave them peace. He gave them the opportunity to have a relationship with God. So He grabbed these people's hearts. He taught them that they have a way to be with God. Not through tradition or ceremony, but through Him. He brought the Word of God to life. And it wasn't that He left them off the hook. That all the commandments that had burdened those people for years, that was pounded down upon them, that was heaped upon them, that they could never live up to. They didn't even probably really expect to live up to. He didn't make it easy on them. He said, you want to talk about thou shalt not kill? Even the thought of it is a sin. You want to talk about do not commit adultery? A lustful thought. You've already done it. And He was paving the way to show them that anything that they were doing in the environment that they were living in right now was no good. He was the Messiah. He was their hope. He was all that they had. And the people were amazed. They were amazed at the hope, the liberty, the difference that this man had spoke other than the, the Pharisees and the scribes who had given him nothing. And what about us? The Lord Jesus Christ gave them hope. How about us? Do we live every day of our lives in that blessed hope? Do we understand in every circumstance in our life that the Lord Jesus Christ is with us? That He loves us? That He is going to take care of all of the things that give us anxiety and helpless thoughts and thoughts of, of what am I going to do? What am I going to do? The Lord Jesus Christ is in control of all. And it is amazing. You want to be amazed by the Lord Jesus Christ? Each and every one of us have read how many times in our Bibles, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and saw God's reaction to sin. God absolutely hates sin. He detests it. How many times have we read about the wrath of God on sin? You're saved, right? So now you don't sin anymore. Well, no, that, that's not right. I sin. You sin. And what are we taught to do? Confess our sins. We create an injustice against God that we know that He hates. He hates with a passion. But Christ forgives those sins. He takes it away. How can I do something after I'm saved that is so displeasing to God and with a moment with Christ, a confession to our Lord, it's taken away. We just confess it, get up and go to bed. Think about what just happened the second you confessed it. That Christ dealt with it. And He took it away. And then the Lord Jesus goes to that man who has an evil spirit with him. And he, and he deals with that guy. And the guy's saying, what do you want with us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One. And he rambles on and on. And here's that possessed man standing in front of him. And the, the Lord says, be quiet. Leave. Be quiet and leave. And the man goes into convulsions and he's flopping around and everything, and then he's calm. 
He's in his right mind. And the people are amazed. They're totally amazed at what they have just seen. They heard the Lord Jesus Christ. They heard him talk and telling them things they never... But now they see that he deals with an unclean spirit in this man. And they say... Um, the kind of authority that Jesus demonstrated left the people in the synagogue. What is this? A new teaching and a new, new authority that he even has command over the spirits. First, the Lord Jesus Christ told them that he would free them from the bonds of slavery that men put upon them. He freed them from the bonds of men and now he shows them that he can free them from the bonds of Satan. <laughs> Amazed? These people were, were totally amazed by the Lord and they had never seen and they had never heard anything like it before. All the amazing things that we see in the Bible, all the amazing things that Christ has done to prove to us who he is, he does them to us today. Each and every one of us is touched every day of our life by the hand of God, by the Lord Jesus Christ, just like he dealt with those people. We were the blind. Think about it. Bill was talking about, or, or, or um, Will was talking about how he tried to believe. He was telling the kids, man, couldn't get over this thing about being, be what's this believing? We were blind. Completely blind. We had nothing. But Christ revealed himself to us. We were lame. Before we were saved, what did you, did you feel like you could do anything? When you finally recognized the fact that God was right, we were lame. We were like the leper that was headed to the ultimate death that that disease would do to him. We were prodigals. Each and every, uh, each and every one. I always said, Madeline was a better person unsaved than I was saved. She could honor God more just by her natural person than I could. But we were all prodigals. We all turned our back. But he sought to seek and to save that which was lost. The Lord rescued us just like the Samaritans. So each and every one of us was touched by the hand of God. And he gave us hope. He gave us salvation. He gave the miracle of salvation to each and every one of us. If nothing else in your life, you wake up every day and be amazed that Christ picked you. How many billions of people in the world? Six, seven billion? He picked you. He picked me. Why? Why was I given sight? Why was I given strength? Why was I brought back in and put rings on my fingers? It's amazing. The amazement of Christ needs to be first and foremost in our life. We are missing the miracle of our salvation if we continue to go throughout our life and have all the wonders of Christ, all the wonders of creation become a commonplace part of our Christian living taken for granted. No second thought given. If you want to re-energize, if you want to excite your thoughts of the amazement of Jesus Christ in your life, revisit your salvation. Revisit the cross. Revisit all that took place to 
put, where, put you where you are today. And then take inventory of all of the things that Christ has done in your life that day. There's a lot. There's a lot of things that Christ does to help us out each day of our life. And there's sometimes when life is not going that well. Christ is there as well. Because on our own, during those difficult times, when it's so easy to give up, we would give up without Christ. Revisit your salvation. Take inventory of all that Christ has done every day of your life. And you'll build anticipation. Looking at all that He has done for you. And allow that to build into anticipation of what He's going to do today. It's called living with the Lord. It's called not being just a thank you Christian, but then embracing the Lord Jesus Christ every day of your life. And then allowing yourself to be amazed by the presence of the Lord in your life every day. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you for Jesus Christ. Without him, it's a dark, dreary scene. But with him, Our citizenship is in heaven. He walks with us. He outlies. He defeats many obstacles in our way. He helps us to endure things that we have no idea are coming. He is our Lord. He is our Redeemer. And whether it's in the hours of everyday living or at the Bible study Wednesday night, at the morning worship meeting, in the gospel meeting or the ministry meeting, let us be amazed by Christ. That He would guide and lead us and comfort us in every step that we take. All honor and glory to the one who saved us. We thank you for Jesus Christ. In his holy and precious name we pray. Amen.